shot him. A direct quote from the mayor of New York City tonight as the subway shooting suspect is taken into custody. Video shows Frank James with police in handcuffs less than 30 hours after allegedly opening fire and causing chaos on a crowded subway in Brooklyn. Investigators say tips from the public and a call from James himself saying, you're looking for me, led them to the arrest. The investigation into the man police say shot at strangers is just beginning. The FBI scouring his social media presence for more possible clues. ABC News Live Prime has all the angles tonight. Janae Norman and Pierre Thomas standing by. Still masking up on trains, planes, and buses, the CDC extends the face covering mandate across the country. Tonight, the pleas from major airlines to lift the requirement as the number of unruly passengers on flights skyrockets. Graphic and shocking body cam video release shows the deadly police shooting of a black man. Video appears to show a Grand Rapids, Michigan police officer kneeling on the man's back during a confrontation with the officer and shooting him in the head while he's on the ground. What happens next in the investigation? Coal country versus the EPA. The fight over strict emission limits on coal-fired power plants will soon come to a head at the Supreme Court. We travel to West Virginia with rare access inside one of the largest coal-fired plants in the country as the battle to prevent climate change heats up. I grew up in coal country. I come from a community where we're seeing massive job losses, massive job losses. So can solar and coal coexist here? Coal and solar have to coexist here opening up their homes and their hearts. The American family living in Poland that refused to turn a blind eye when refugees search for a safe place to stay. When you're staring refugees who have been traveling for many days and they have nothing but the clothes on their backs, you don't really make a plan, you just say yes and I'll figure it out. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. One big sigh of relief here in New York City and beyond after a 29-hour manhunt has concluded. The man suspected of firing 33 times on a crowded Brooklyn subway car is now in custody. Frank James was caught by police today in Manhattan's East Village. And we're standing by to talk with a good Samaritan who says that he actually recognized the suspect and flagged down police. Tonight, James has been transferred to federal custody. He's charged with committing a terrorist act on a mass transit system. And we've learned more chilling details about just what happened in that Sunset Park subway station one day ago. Authorities now say that James actually hopped back on the R train, which quickly left the station yesterday after the shooting, so they believe that he made his getaway in a different subway car packed with traumatized commuters. And over the course of the past day and a half, authorities are learning more about just who James is and what might have motivated him. He had a known rap sheet with the NYPD nine prior arrests over a six year period in the 90s. Investigators are looking to his YouTube account where he made statements about the subway and New York City's mayor. And we're learning more about his gun and his alleged path to that subway platform. We have team coverage tonight. Janae Norman leads us off from Brooklyn. This is the moment police arrested the suspect for the subway rampage, taking him into custody in the middle of the day on a busy Manhattan street. Oh my God, yeah, they caught him. Authorities say someone had called in a tip to the Crime Stoppers hotline saying their suspect was in the East Village. And tonight, ABC News has learned that remarkably, police believe that call may have come from the suspect himself. I think you're looking for me, said the man on the line. I'm seeing my picture all over the news and I'll be around this McDonald's. In the moments before his arrest, bystanders taking these pictures of Frank James wandering around the area. Zach DeHaan, who was in a store nearby, spotted James and flagged down police. I see the police walking from over there. I thought the police, this is the guy. He did the problem in Brooklyn. This guy, catch him, guy, catch him. And he catch him. Thank God we catch him. Within minutes, Mayor Eric Adams breaking the news to the city. My fellow New Yorkers, we got him. Police Commissioner Keechan Sewell describing an exhaustive dragnet. We used every resource at our disposal to gather and process significant evidence that directly links Mr. James to the shooting. We were able to shrink his world quickly. There was nowhere left for him to run. 
At the scene of the crime, police say they found two bags, one containing this Glock 17 pistol. Authorities tracing the weapon back to James, finding he purchased it legally in Ohio 11 years ago. They also found a U-Haul key at the scene. The company telling investigators James rented the truck in Philadelphia earlier this month. Hundreds of police scoured security cameras across the region, piecing together a timeline. With the help of this image, they say shows that U-Haul driving into Brooklyn hours before the shooting. According to police, James parked not far from the subway station. They say this video, part of the investigation, shows him entering the station where he would board the train. Eyewitnesses instrumental in building the case. We have witnesses on the train who said he was sitting in the back corner of the second car and he popped the smoke grenade. And we have one witness who says, what did, what did you do? He goes, oops, and then he pops the two, brandishes the firearm and fires 33 times. This man telling CNN he was sitting right next to the shooter when smoke filled the car. This pregnant woman was in front of me. I was trying to help her. I didn't know there were shots at first. I just thought it was a black smoke bomb. She said, I'm pregnant with a baby. I hugged her and then the bum rush continued. I got pushed and that's when I got shot in the back of my knee. In the chaos, police say James disappeared into the crowd. We believe Mr. James boarded an R train that had pulled into the station. That train quickly departing in an effort to rush passengers to safety. Unknown to them, police believe the suspect was also on board. Authorities say this video shows James emerging from the subway and disappearing into the city. But by nightfall, his face was everywhere. And tonight, a little more than 29 hours after the attack, James transferred into federal custody. So many relieved now that he is in custody. Janae Norman joins us now. Janae, you've spent the entire day in the neighborhood. How did people react when you told them that the suspect had been caught? Oh, well, Lindy, there's a young woman who I spoke with who saw the immediate aftermath of the attack yesterday. When I told her that he had been captured, she called it a relief. And there was the mom, a mom I spoke with yesterday. I saw her again today walking with four young children. When I said police captured Frank James, she said, I know, put her hand to her heart, pointed to the sky and said, thank God. And Lindsay, you know, New Yorkers known for their resilience back on those subways today. No surprise there. Janae Norman, who's been following the story from the very beginning. Thanks so much. Joining us now is Francisco Puebla, who says that he recognized the suspect, Frank James. Thank you so much for being here with us, Francisco. So tell us exactly what happened today, and, and when did you realize that the man that you were looking at was indeed the man suspected of being the subway shooter? So basically, um, we were standing right here where I'm standing right now. Uh, me, uh, Francisco, and, and Isaac, and Mohammed, the other two guys, the ones that were doing um, basically a camera system, a uh, new camera system for the store. I'm a manager of the store. And um, basically, when uh, we were talking to each other, where we're going to put the positions of the cameras. And at that moment, I turned to my left, which is this way. And at that moment, my eye, it was like seeing this person. Um, and I was shocked, and I like I feel uh, like panic because I see uh, his face and then the hat. Exactly, that it was like 95% sure there was him. And after that, I asked to the other two gentlemen to confirm with me if it was true, if I was right or wrong. And they said after that, um, Mohammed pulled out his phone and he looked at the the face and they said, yes, he is. And after that, we start saying each other, like, let's call 911. But I say, no, I'm not going to call 911 because I don't want it, someone in trouble if I'm not 100% sure that he is, right? And so, but at that moment, there was a police car right by the road because of the red light, right? And so I didn't think tw I didn't think twice. I just run right to the police car, and I asked. I told the police officer to just check that person that is like in the middle of the block because I think that's the person that he did the shooting uh, last morning. And after that, police officer told me, "You sure?" I said, "I'm not sure, police officer, but you can go and check." And basically, he took action and then uh, just go behind. 
and that's how they get him. Uh, after that, I, I feel panic. I might even want to go behind and check what, what was going on because he was carrying a backpack and he was uh, walk, walking that way. And so, but eventually I decided to go and to see what's going on. And when I get there, you know, police uh, uh, get him and then there is more police come over and that's how, that's how they get him. And yeah, thanks, thanks God uh, they, they get him. So now I think everybody uh, will feel more safe because we see that they caught him, so. When you saw him, I know you said he had a backpack and, and he was walking. Was he very casually walking? Did he was, did he seem to be heading anywhere? No, he was just, just walking like a, uh, heading, I don't know, somewhere. And, uh, but he, he was just walking like normal, like, like he didn't do anything before, like something. It's like normal person. Yes, it like was cursing uh, and talking himself. And but basically, yeah, that's that's what we saw. Have you processed uh, that that he was just walking the streets of New York as if nothing happened, and and you happened to to see him and then get the police's attention? Yeah, I mean that's what uh, uh, I I I feel like. Really, uh, how can that happen? You know, like as you can see right now, like many people walking and nobody. Uh, uh, like saw him or recognize him and like when I, I saw him he was like my eye just went right to his face and I recognized him like right away um, but I see like now I noticed that we're not watching each other here <laughs> but I guess uh, in my case I see something I say something you know I didn't stay quiet I just took action and then told the police officer you know and that's what we are told to do, right? If you see something, say something. Did you happen to see how Frank James reacted when, when he saw the police officers approaching him? Yeah, I saw him, but he was like normal person. He didn't resist anything. He just like staying calm and then that's how they get him. Well, Francisco, our, our thanks to you. I think, you know, the, the whole city of New York is is thanking you for, as you said, seeing something and, and saying something and getting that police officer's attention. We thank you so much for talking with us as well tonight. Yeah, thank you also. You know, now I think we feel more safe uh, because we know we they get him. And obviously I have family. I always use the train and now I like, and I, I, I can feel more safe because they, they got him, but you know, th thanks God they got him. Yes. So. I think we all feel safer, Francisco. Thank you. And we heard the FBI say today that this case is far from over and they are still asking for the public's help. Let's bring in our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. And Pierre, you've been reporting for months now about the growing concern over lone wolves and law enforcement authorities are now pouring through Frank James's social media posts. They are pouring through his social media posts and what they've seen, Lindsay, is frightening. There was evidence he may have been a ticking time bomb. Yet it appears no one alerted authorities. And one video posted the day before the subway shooting, he allegedly said, I can say I wanted to kill people. I wanted to watch people die. And in another video, it's clear his attention had shifted to New York City, allegedly saying, Mr. Mayor, I'm a victim of your mental health program. I'm 63, now full of hate, full of anger, and full of bitterness. Lindsay, he also talks about New York's homeless situation. Tonight, a critical question. Did anyone view these posts? The FBI says this investigation is far from over. They still want any New Yorkers with any tips to call in. Lindsay? All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. And we turn now to former FBI profiler and ABC News analyst Brad Garrett. Uh, Brad, thanks for joining us. So new details about Frank James have been coming out all day. As a profiler, what information sticks out to you? So uh, let's just start where Pierre left off, which are some of the social media posts where he rants. He rants about the subway system, the homeless people in the subway system. He rants to the mayor about uh, crime that, that the mayor's not taking care of. Uh, and then he sort of switches gears at some point and talks about harming other people, how and there's another post I think Pierre didn't talk about where he just said he wanted to go out and start shooting people. 
So you look at that and you, you say to yourself, Lindsay, well, everything I just said, which is a paraphrase, is not against the law. He didn't threaten an individual. He didn't threaten a particular location. And this is the real dilemma when you look at people like Frank James. Is he troubled? Does he have all sorts of problems? Uh, did he acquire a firearm, which he did legally? Yes. Did he have things that were suspicious, like gasoline that he was carrying, uh, incendiary devices like smoke-type canisters, fireworks? Again, none of that stuff is against the law, but it's all troubling when you look at it. Sadly, there are many people in this country that are in the same mental state as Frank James. And most of them don't go out and commit mass shootings, but some of them do. And the trick is, how does law enforcement get in front of the likes of Mr. James? And the answer is, they don't, unless somebody tips them off, that they have heard him say things that are so troubling that the police, and maybe, if it's appropriate, the mental health community, actually deals with him. I mean, it's, it's pretty significant. He makes a comment about the failure of the mental health system in New York. It'll be fascinating to see what that is all about at some point. But what I'm trying to tell you is that th that's the problem with mass shooters, is troubled, yes. Make violent comments, yes. Acquire handguns, assault rifles, yes. But they don't go shoot anybody. And, and you're that's, saying- you know, if, you're, if you're in law enforcement, where do you put yourself? That's the problem. And so before you shoot anybody, it seems like all of those things that, that are red flags are still not enough to necessarily have uh, authorities actually take action preemptively, you know, because many people certainly tonight are still asking why, you know, what was the motive here? Uh, from what we know so far, what's your insight? What's your take on that? So every mass shooter reaches a trigger, a trigger of they can't take it anymore. They feel powerless. You know, there may be mental health issues with them, whatever it might be, they feel like their life is going downhill quickly and they've not really done anything significant. And they're angry. They're mad at the world. I mean, he talks about it in these rants that he's mad at the world and he's going to go take revenge on people. And I will tell you, unless he's completely different than every mass shooter that I've studied, is that he didn't care that he was shooting people, no matter whether they were children or adults, in that car, because what he what he believed is that he was doing the right thing for him. It, you know, it's sort of the ultimate in narcissism. And this incident has given pause for anyone who commutes on mass transit. Would you say that the big city subways are, are just too soft of a target? Well, they're clearly a soft target because I mean, Lindsay, three million people, you know this, three million people a day ride the New York City subway system. How can you make a system where you virtually have a police officer in every car? It's not realistic. You could have one at each station, perhaps. But what would that have stopped today? You have a guy walking by, doesn't have a gas mask on, doesn't have a firearm that you can apparently see, has on a vest that may say MTA or something else on it. There's probably thousands of people with MTA vests walking around. He walks in, he walks right by a police officer, maybe, hypothetically. What do you do about that? If you don't really know that he's coming to do that, you can't stop him. You can't screen three million people a day. It, it just, no one would ever get on the subway system. And right. so it's, it, it, that's the real dilemma. You can only make them so safe. Brad Garrett, our thanks to you as always for your time and insight. And overseas now to the war in Ukraine. Tensions rising ahead of Russia's looming assault on the east. Disturbing new video shows what appears to be banned cluster munitions shelling a civilian area in Kharkiv. Tonight, the U.S. is stepping up, offering a new round of military aid. James Longman in Kyiv once again for us tonight. Tonight, disturbing new video from Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine it appears to show what military experts say are cluster bombs being used to attack the city and terrorize civilians. In response to Russia's onslaught in the east, the U.S. is putting more weapons in the hands of Ukrainian fighters. An $800 million package, including long-range artillery systems, which are being sent to Ukraine for the first time. Ammunition and armored personnel carriers, too. 
And there'll be more help in the skies. Additional helicopters now going in as well. He failed to take Kyiv, but tonight Vladimir Putin is positioning his troops for that eastern assault. Satellite images show his forces on the move, armored vehicles and support equipment ready to attack. Putin says he wants to combat what he calls the NATO threat, but tonight that strategic goal unraveling. We need to assess how our possible NATO membership... Finland and Sweden, traditionally neutral, are now moving closer to membership in the alliance. This comes after President Biden, for the first time, called Russia's war in Ukraine genocide. Yes, I call it genocide. Putin is just trying to wipe out the idea of even being able to be a Ukrainian. And uh, the, mount, the evidence is mounting. The discovery of five bodies in a Butra basement, their hands bound, apparently tortured and executed, alerted the world to possible war crimes here. And tonight, the mother of one of those men is speaking out. They came like a hurricane, causing so much pain. And for what, she asks. Galina Machoshko has now taken refuge at a monastery. She's too scared to go home. She says her son, Serhi, was helping evacuees when the Russians arrived. For what, she keeps repeating. She can't understand his pointless murder. Russia says this didn't happen. What would you say to Vladimir Putin? Look at what you did to us, she says. What is our fault? What have I done wrong? Why am I crying at a stranger's place with no home to live in? You have children. What if the same happened to them? When our people come to tell you it's all fake, would you believe them? A mother's tears, just so heart-wrenching there. James Longman joins us now from Kiev. And James, we've now heard Biden call Russia's war in Ukraine genocide, but, but what impact does that have now going forward? Well, President Biden, I think, is just trying to move the envelope on this. He's trying to raise this in the international community. It's a legal definition, of course, and so he wants the lawyers to start looking at it. Uh, of course, there, there does seem to be a difference, though, of opinion on the international stage. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, has refused to call it genocide. He's, he's spoken about Ukrainians and Russians being brothers of sorts, uh, and so for, for him, it doesn't qualify as genocide. That's been met with an anger response here in Ukraine. But I think, ultimately, just the fact is, and if you, if you look at the mother of one of those men that we saw in the basement dead and what she said to me there, whatever this is, it is just horrific. Lindsay? It is truly. All right, James Longman, our thanks to you once again. Now to the pandemic. The CDC has extended the mask mandate on public transportation and airplanes for two more weeks. It's a move that airlines have opposed. But COVID cases are once again on the rise linked to the contagious Omicron subvariant. Here's ABC's Eva Pilgrim. Tonight, the CDC extending the mask mandate on public transit until at least May 3rd while it tracks a rise in COVID cases. But that move leaving some air travelers frustrated. Enough already. Let's just get on with life. At this point, we're living, learning to live with it, so just put it behind us. It's the fifth time the mask rule has been extended on planes, trains, and buses despite mounting pressure on the Biden administration. The airline industry insists the air filtration system on board is highly protective. The reality is, the science and the data says you're safer on an airplane than you are anywhere else. But health experts caution there are still risks beyond the flight itself. If you are flying and you are experiencing the excellent air exchange that we have in our modern aircraft, um, then you're probably fine. But there are a lot of variables. The time that you're taxiing, the time that you're getting on and off the airplane. COVID cases are now climbing in 30 states. Next week, the city of Philadelphia will join a growing list of college campuses bringing back mask mandates. I think it's more important that we stay healthy and safe. And with infections climbing tonight, there is more evidence out of Israel that a second booster reduced COVID symptoms, hospitalizations, and deaths in people over 60. Anyone over 50 in this country can get a second booster shot, but the CDC only recommends it for people with underlying conditions and everyone over 65. Dr. Anthony Fauci going a step further, saying he thinks everyone authorized for a second booster should get one. I recommend you go and get the shot if you are over 50. Dr. Fauci very clear about his guidance. There are thanks to Eva. And when we come back, the rescue after car plunged 300 feet off of a cliff. The graphic body cam video released late today that shows the deadly police shooting of a black man in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But first, our journey deep into West Virginia's coal country, where we get rare access inside one of the largest coal-fired plants in the country. Will the Supreme Court limit the EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse emissions here? 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. In the next few weeks, the U.S. Supreme Court will issue a major decision on the ability of the Environmental Protection Agency to set strict limits on greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. It will impact the fight against climate change and efforts to protect communities already feeling the effects. Tonight, we're in the heart of coal country, West Virginia, for a closer look at the stakes with rare access inside one of the largest coal-fired power plants in the country. Here's Devin Dwyer. The water was over the face of the clock and over the top of the cars. In Clendenin, West Virginia, scars of a 1,000-year flood are still visible on Main Street. This was steps to a, to a building that was like a restaurant before. In 2016, torrential rains from a passing storm inundated the Elk River Basin, killing 23 people and causing more than a billion dollars in damage. We have a lot of uh, less fortunate people in our area. So that even made it worse. The storm that hit was exceptional and rare, but scientists say the threat from severe floods fueled by climate change is rising across West Virginia, compounded by its unique landscape and mining for coal. Mountaintop removal to get easy access to coal has created vulnerabilities for these valley communities. Water rushes off these hillsides into the streams. West Virginia has had more flooding disasters over the last 70 years than any other state except California and Texas. Storms have been more frequent and more powerful, dumping 55% more rain. I have never seen flooding like I've seen here in the past, really in the past 20 years. Maria Gano, whose family has lived in and mined in these mountains for generations, blames greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels, including coal. We can't continue to risk everything for energy. You know, I mean, the coal keeps the lights on, they say. 
but at what cost? As climate costs mount, West Virginia's political leaders and energy companies are fighting to defend coal at the U.S. Supreme Court, which will decide this spring how far the federal government can go in regulating greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. It has incredible um, potential to affect how EPA and other agencies write regulations for years to come. This is one of the largest coal-fired power plants in the country, John Amos, right here. These are the 50 acres of Appalachian coal that's taken by these conveyor belts from barges and rail into the power plant facility just down the way. It's one of 174 coal-fired plants nationwide that will be impacted by the court's decision. It burns up to 27,000 tons of coal a day, powering more than 2 million homes and businesses across three states. This is where the coal is actually burned, ignited through these burners into the boilers, creating 3,000 degree heat, sending ash and greenhouse gases through the pipes. Last year, it released 10.8 million tons of CO2, or the equivalent of more than 2 million cars driven for a year. The plant has been emitting earth-warming gases since the early 1970s. EPA regulations forced coal-fired power plants to install what are called scrubbers. These contraptions at the bottoms of the stacks to remove sulfur dioxide from the exhaust. What they don't remove is carbon dioxide. As the EPA prepares to issue new limits on carbon dioxide, power plant officials and allies like Clendenin Mayor Kay Summers worry it could lead to fewer jobs and higher electricity prices. They want to make rules, but they don't understand because they don't walk in those shoes. So how much has coal been a part of your life and your family? Oh, it's pretty much everybody's, you know, West Virginia period, it's pretty much in everybody's life. Ricky Brookover, a union boilermaker who works overnight at John Amos, welcomes the state's plan to keep burning coal there until 2040. I think we need coal until we have, an, you know, until they figure out an alternate source. Do people feel like the climate is changing because of the gases coming out of the plant? No, I don't think in this area people really do. When they hear EPA, what do they think? They probably cringe at it. Cringe? Right. West Virginia generates about 90% of its electricity from coal-fired power plants. While many states in the country have begun pivoting quickly away from coal, this state is digging in. Well, the EPA does have a narrow array of authority to act in the area of carbon emissions. It's nowhere near what the Biden administration is suggesting. West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey is leading the group of 18 states suing the EPA over its power to regulate greenhouse gases. Why fight the EPA when they're fighting to protect West Virginia from some of the most harmful impacts of climate change? I mean, isn't that what they're trying to do? Our people want to have clean air. They want to have clean water. Absolutely. But you have to go through the process the right way. To allow unelected bureaucrats to just decide it under the guise of good government, that's not right. This is Congress's decision to make, not the EPA. But you, know, you look at the Clean Air Act, and Congress pretty explicitly there asked for the EPA to do some regulatory work. Well, the authority wasn't delegated to the EPA to run and completely reorder the state's electricity systems. The EPA the says Clean Air Act authority is critical to cutting U.S. carbon emissions in half by 2030. If West Virginia succeeds in limiting that authority, that goal could be impossible to meet. Why is that authority so important? because it protects human health and the environment. If they can't respond to uh, new and emerging threats, then Congress would have to pass a law every time something new comes along. While the legal fight plays out, energy companies have slowly been transitioning to cheaper alternatives to coal. It's still the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, but plays a smaller and smaller role in powering America. I grew up in coal country. I come from a community where we're seeing massive job losses, massive job losses. So can solar and coal coexist here? Coal and solar have to coexist here. In the shadow of the John Amos power plant, Keena Mullins runs West Virginia's largest commercial solar installation. She's not opposed to coal or the EPA, but says solar needs to be part of the state's future. You're not trying to replace coal. You're trying to get a seat at the table with a market that's evolving. Absolutely. Just like um, in your household, you would not want to put all your eggs in one basket. It's just diversifying our energy portfolio. Do you feel like coal is dying here? Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah. 
Coal may be dying, but many here aren't ready to let it go. And as the state wages war on the EPA, environmental advocates are braced for the worst. What's the impact going to be here? The impact here is going to be increased mining, increased pollution. The coal industry has always kept our people in the dark. And I don't look for it to change. And in Clendenin, they're still rebuilding and still skeptical of an EPA trying to protect them from the worst of climate change. How concerned are you about this happening again? I'll be honest with you, every time it rains and storms, I'm lying awake at night. But I really, I know it can happen, but I just don't think it will happen again. It, yes, it was a thousand year flood, but the warmer we get, the more intense and Is it more warm right now? Frequent. And what's the date? <laughs> it's cold. That's right. It's cold right now. It's weather all over. You know what? I'm not a scientist and I just don't believe it. Can coal and solar coexist? Something you're going to be hearing a lot about in the coming days. Our thanks to Devin for bringing us that. Still ahead here on Prime, the new move by the governor of Texas is causing major backlogs at border crossings. Sudden history made in the MLB. The first woman coaching on the field during a game tonight. She says she was prepared for the moment. Also, the new investigation revealing just how much America's highest earners pay in taxes. We go by the numbers. First, our tweet of the day, the president of Lithuania posting this photo of the heads of Estonia, Latvia, and Poland with President Zelensky in Kyiv, show of solidarity. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everyone. A new investigation by ProPublica is revealing the top income earners in the U.S. and how much they paid in taxes. Let's take a look by the numbers. The report is based on a trove of IRS data obtained by ProPublica on the 400 Americans who earned the most income between 2013 and 2018. It took an average of $110 million a year in income to make the list. A typical American making $40,000 a year would have to work 2,750 years to make the same as the lowest earner in this 
analyst group that they made in just one year. The top 11 earners on the list had an average income of more than $1 billion a year from 2013 to 2018. Bill Gates earned an average of $2.85 billion a year in that period, putting him at the top. Tech billionaires made up 10 of the top 15. About 20% of the top 400 were hedge funds managers, making them the largest group in the top 400 with annual incomes mostly from trading stocks. But some billionaires earned far less. Warren Buffett's average income was $28 million in that time span, as most of his wealth is held in unsold stock. When it comes to taxes, the ultra-rich often pay far less since long-term capital gains on stock sales are taxed at 20% compared to nearly double that at 37% for ordinary income like salary. ProPublica found that those with incomes ranging between two to five million dollars paid an average 29 percent tax rate, but above that tax rates actually fall the further up in income you go with charitable deductions and lower rates reducing the amount owed. That meant that collectively the top 400 paid an average tax rate of 22 percent from 2013 to 2018 according to ProPublica. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The American family in Poland open up their hearts and their home to more than 20 refugees. Also the latest from the family of Trevor Reed one day after their son made a court appearance in Russia. And the new admission by actor Cuba Gooding Jr. in court after he had long denied groping three different women. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live national parks are incredibly safe places a crime will happen my wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. We're able to say we got it. Investigators saying 62 year old Frank James is now in police custody. Officers, in response to a Crime Stoppers tip, stopped Mr. James. He was taken into custody without incident. 
and has been transported to an NYPD facility. Authorities say James boarded a Manhattan-bound N train during the Tuesday morning commute, detonated two smoke grenades, and began shooting. Police say 29 people were hurt, 10 of them treated at the hospital for gunshot wounds, all of them surviving. Investigators discovered James was armed with an arsenal of weapons, including a semi-automatic handgun with extended magazines, a hatchet, commercial-grade fireworks, and apparent gasoline. We used every resource at our disposal to gather and process significant evidence that directly links Mr. James to the shooting. We were able to shrink his world quickly. There was nowhere left for him to run. Police focused on this U-Haul, found abandoned just miles from the shooting scene. They say James was driving it before the attack, seen here in this video posted to his YouTube account. I am driving, I am driving, I am driving because I started my trip early. Anger growing in Texas over the governor's orders for enhanced searches of trucks crossing the border from Mexico. Produce importers say the governor's order is creating long lines at the border checkpoints. I'd like him to speed up the process. There are no bathrooms in the line. There's no food and no water. We have to wait 10 to 12 hours. Let's be sympathetic towards our truck drivers. The Texas International Produce Association has written to the governor pleading with him to find a different way to address illegal immigration. Actor Cuba Gooding Jr. pleading guilty to forcible touching and sex assault in New York. Prosecutors accusing him of groping three different women. He was arrested in June 2019 after a woman said he groped her at a rooftop bar in Times Square. Two other accusers then coming forward reporting separate incidents. Gooding, who had long denied the charges, apologizing in court. Comes nearly three years after Gooding's arrest in the case. As part of a plea deal, Gooding will not face time in jail. Twitter's largest shareholder, Elon Musk, now facing a lawsuit over his purchase of millions of shares of Twitter stock. The class action suit accuses Musk of delaying filing the proper paperwork as he was buying a 9% share in the company. That delay, the suit says, kept the stock price from rising and cheated some investors out of profits. The daring rescue in Los Angeles, a car plunging about 300 feet over the side of a cliff in Griffith Park. Rangers and firefighters climbing down to the driver trapped in her car. The vehicle was crushed from the fall. Thankfully, the 68-year-old driver was alert and talking as she was pulled out on a stretcher. Rescuers airlifting her out of the canyon and to a nearby hospital. The cause of the crash is not yet known. History was made at the Giants-Padres game last night. Giants assistant coach Alyssa Nacken uh, became the first woman to coach on field in MLB history. Nacken came in to coach first base for the Giants in the third inning after Antoine uh, Richardson was ejected. She was greeted warmly from the crowd as she got on the field and the Padres first baseman Eric Hosmer shook her hand. 31-year-old Talmud is already heading to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. In Grand Rapids, Michigan tonight, there is growing outrage over graphic body cam video release that shows the deadly police shooting of a black man following a traffic stop. It appears to show an officer on top of the driver during a struggle. The officer then pulls out his gun and shoots. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. Stay in the car! Stay in the car! Police in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who've been accused of hiding details in this case, say tonight they're sharing all the video they have. No, no, no. Stop, stop. Put your hands right. The video from the officer's body camera and dash camera, from a cell phone and from a security camera recording from across the street, all show the moment when the unidentified officer pulls over 26-year-old Patrick Leoya in the morning of April 4th. What started with a license plate that wasn't registered to the vehicle turned into a struggle when the 26-year-old tried to run and then fought with this police officer in front of witnesses and cameras. Stop! Okay. You see them struggle over the officer's stun gun even as the officer fires it. In the last few moments, the officer is on top of the man and then pulls out his gun and fires. Drop taser! The police chief confirmed today that his officer shot the young man in the head and says he's not identifying the officer since he hasn't been charged. There is an entire investigation being conducted by the Michigan State Police, which I do not have access to by design for conflict of interest. The attorney for the victim's family says he was an African immigrant who was confused by the encounter and terrified for his life. 
we demand that the officer who killed Patrick not only be terminated, but be arrested and prosecuted. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami. In Russia, detained American Trevor Reed is on day 971 of his detention, nearly three years. And this week, Trevor appeared virtually in a Russian court to appeal his nine-year conviction. But the court did not reach a resolution because Reed was not provided with a copy of his court record in English. We're joined now by Joey Reed, Trevor's dad. Thank you, as always, for talking with us, Mr. Reed. I, I assume that you weren't surprised by the outcome yesterday, but what was it like to see your son in court at least? No, we were not uh, surprised. Uh, I've seen this happen a couple of times in the dozens of uh, hearings that I've been to in Russia in three different court systems. Um, but uh, we were, uh, it's like what usually happens when we hear our son or we're able to see him. It's, we're glad to see he's alive, but uh, it was, uh, um, it was not good to see what uh, bad condition he's in. He's, uh, he's lost a lot of weight. Um, he just, if you look at the pictures there, he looks ill. He looks like you would expect someone who's living in a third world uh, gulag. And as you just said, you know, he, he reportedly ended his, his recent hugger strike. But when you're looking at that video feed from court yesterday, just how concerned are you about his health? We're, we're very concerned. Uh, the Russian government is still uh, saying that they've tested him for uh, uh, for tuberculosis. They've been saying that for weeks, and yet my son says, to his knowledge, they've never tested him. And uh, even if they did test him and said that he was not uh, uh, that he was not positive, we would not believe it. They have lied about his medical records and his medical treatment the entire time he's been in prison there. And you and your wife, Paula, camped out in front of the White House and were given a 45-minute meeting with President Biden recently. After that meeting, are, are you confident that the U.S. is doing everything in its power to, to try to get your son back home? Well, I don't think confident would be the right word. Uh, we're realists. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're very, very hopeful. And, uh, and, and we were more hopeful after we met with the president. Uh, which is what we had expected and wanted. We just felt like if we could talk to him directly and tell him about our son. And, uh, and I should also mention that we always mention Paul Whelan and all of the other Americans wrongfully detained around the world. But we, we're hopefully we made an impact on him, not only for our son, but for everyone out there. Are you able to share at all what the president said to you? Uh, not much. Uh, it's just that, you know, he says that they're, you know, continually, you know, working on uh, ways to bring him home. And, you know, we, we said, you know, things like, well, we've been told that everything's on the table and um, we believe that you need to start getting to the other things on the table because whatever uh, the Trump administration and your administration have been doing is not working. And uh, we need to get to it. We, and we, of course, believe our family believes that the, the only way we're getting him home is through a prisoner exchange, which is what uh, President Putin and all of their government officials have been saying since, uh, you know, for two years. And did President Biden seem that that was something that he was willing and able to do? He did not acknowledge that. He and I, I would not either, either if I was the executive. Um, but he listened intently uh, on to, you know, our uh, our concerns and and. Um, what we see is happening and what we we believe should happen. Um, and I mean, to, to for the most powerful man in the world to uh, sit there and listen to your views on, on the subject is uh, uh, makes us very hopeful. And I understand that Trevor was able to talk with his girlfriend recently. When's the last time that you and your wife were able to speak with him? Well, as you know, there was a, a period of uh, 232 days where they didn't let him call us or the embassy. Um, he was allowed to call his girlfriend uh, sporadically through that time period. Most of that time he was in solitary confinement for refusing to work. And then just before, uh, actually, just before the war started, they uh, they took him out of solitary confinement for some reason. Uh, you know, they left him out. Um, and then a week or two after that, after the war started, they let him, they let him start calling the embassy. That was in March, uh, but then he went to the hospital for a week, and when he came back, uh, they wouldn't let him call again. And so that's you know, so it's been we're going on what another month since we've we've heard from him. So, and, and lastly, Mr. Reed, is there anything that gives you hope at this point that this situation might be resolved in the short term, and 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 you both can see your son again soon? Uh, just simply our meeting with the president, and uh, and you know we. 
we believe uh, from things that we've heard that, you know, that we did have an impact on the president as we expected. He, he's a caring, kind man. And, uh, you know, when you make it a, a personal thing with him, I, I believe he's going to do something about it. And again, we tried to make it personal, but at the same time, uh, you know, we, our son is not the only person in this situation and our government needs to start bringing Americans home. Well, all the best to you, Mr. Reed. You and your family, of course, remain in our thoughts and, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lindsay, as always. We turn now to an especially touching story, how one American family living in Poland has opened up their home and hearts to more than 20 refugees. ABC News' Maggie Ruley has this story. OT and Julie Benson moved to Krakow, Poland from the suburbs of Detroit for work less than two months ago. You're looking at new pictures of evacuations that are happening right now. As the family of 10 began their new life abroad, war was breaking out across the border in Ukraine, and OT knew he couldn't just turn a blind eye. When you're staring refugees who have been traveling for many days and they have nothing but the clothes on their backs, you don't really make a plan. You just say yes and I'll figure it out. It was at church during those first few days when OT decided to heed the bishop's call to house Ukrainian refugees in his own home. And over the past four weeks, the Benson's home has been a refuge for at least nine families, some staying for a night, others for weeks. At one point, packing the house with 21 people. You just kind of adapt on the fly, almost like an open house. Our job is to try to make them feel safe and make them feel like they're uh, with us, that they're like at their home. So that's what I, we're trying to do. And every day see them happy and smiling, I think that is the best reward. The new family is adding to an already full house. Five of the couple's eight children moved with them to Poland. At first, I was a little um, nervous, kind of, because our family is really big. But then we had our first group of people stay with us, and they were so amazing and so kind and genuine. And it was, it was really humbling to see them. When we visit, Oksana Timchenko and her four daughters are living there. She says her girls miss home. They miss their dad who had to stay behind. But here, they are happy. They treat her children like their own. The family's communicating using Google Translate and the universal language of laughter. <laughs> the kids playing cards together, eating ice cream, watching cartoons. But OT says there have also been hard times. We had boys that would be here in the, in the backyard playing and they would see a plane fly over and react in a very, uh, you know, scared way, screaming. And we said, what are they saying? And the other kids would say, oh, rocket, rocket. It looks like something they saw a few weeks ago. He says it's not only the refugees that are changing from these experiences, it's his own kids as well. I think they come quickly to the realization that this is a different place, a different time, and it makes you grow up a lot faster which for me as a dad, I'm glad that they can do that, that they can see that. And I want them to understand what it means to serve others and help others. Setting such a great example. Our thanks to Maggie Ruley for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. This is Francisco Puebla, who we spoke with earlier, seen here with Zach DeHaan. Both men identified the Brooklyn subway shooting suspect today, waving outside of a police precinct after James's arrest. Everyone across the city, of course, breathing a deep sigh of relief. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. next hour, we talk with a former American banker about why Vladimir Putin is so desperate to capture him. And our conversation with the first black housewife to grace the real housewives of Beverly Hills about her brand new book. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Nearly two dozen people were injured when tornadoes swept through Texas overnight. In total, eight separate twisters were recorded across Texas and Iowa. The storm system is heading east. Western Tennessee and Arkansas are under a tornado warning tonight. And Delta Airlines is no longer charging unvaccinated employees an extra $200 per month for the company's health plan. Delta CEO Ed Bastian said the company is dropping the surcharge because they now believe that the pandemic has moved to a seasonal virus. Amazon announced it's raising the fees it charges third-party sellers. The company says the 5% fuel inflation surcharge is necessary to offset rising costs. The fees will go into effect April 28th. Following an intense search, the NYPD says that they have arrested Frank James, a suspect who allegedly opened fire on a crowded subway train in Brooklyn, New York. Ten people were shot. A total of 29 were injured in the chaos. Investigators gave new details of James's capture this afternoon. ABC's Janae Norman has been tracking it all for us. This is the moment police arrested the suspect for the subway rampage, taking him into custody in the middle of the day on a busy Manhattan street. Oh my God, yeah, they caught him. Authorities say someone had called in a tip to the Crime Stoppers hotline saying their suspect was in the East Village. And tonight, ABC News has learned that remarkably, police believe that call may have come from the suspect himself. I think you're looking for me, said the man on the line. I'm seeing my picture all over the news and I'll be around this McDonald's. In the moments before his arrest, bystanders taking these pictures of Frank James wandering around the area. Zach DeHaan, who was in a store nearby, spotted James and flagged down police. I see the police walking from over there. I thought the police, this is the guy. He did the problem in Brooklyn. This guy, catch him, guy, catch him. And he catch him. Thank God we catch him. Within minutes, Mayor Eric Adams breaking the news to the city. My fellow New Yorkers, we got him. Police Commissioner Keechan Sewell describing an exhaustive dragnet. We used every resource at our disposal to gather and process significant evidence that directly links Mr. James to the shooting. We were able to shrink his world quickly. There was nowhere left for him to run. At the scene of the crime, police say they found two bags, one containing this Glock 17 pistol. Authorities tracing the weapon back to James, finding he purchased it legally in Ohio 11 years ago. They also found a U-Haul key at the scene. The company telling investigators James rented the truck in Philadelphia earlier this month. 
Hundreds of police scoured security cameras across the region, piecing together a timeline. With the help of this image, they say shows that U-Haul driving into Brooklyn hours before the shooting. According to police, James parked not far from the subway station. They say this video, part of the investigation, shows him entering the station where he would board the train. Eyewitnesses instrumental in building the case. We have witnesses on the train who said he was sitting in the back corner of the second car and he popped the smoke grenade. And we have one witness who says, what did, what did you do? He goes, oops, and then he pops the two, brandishes the firearm and fires 33 times. This man telling CNN he was sitting right next to the shooter when smoke filled the car. This pregnant woman was in front of me. I was trying to help her. I didn't know there were shots at first. I just thought it was a black smoke bomb. She said, I'm pregnant with a baby. I hugged her and then the bum rush continued. I got pushed and that's when I got shot in the back of my knee. In the chaos, police say James disappeared into the crowd. We believe Mr. James boarded an R train that had pulled into the station. That train quickly departing in an effort to rush passengers to safety. Unknown to them, police believe the suspect was also on board. Authorities say this video shows James emerging from the subway and disappearing into the city. But by nightfall, his face was everywhere. And tonight, a little more than 29 hours after the attack, James transferred into federal custody. Such a relief to so many. Our thanks to Janae Norman for that. Overseas now to the war in Ukraine. Tensions rising ahead of Russia's looming assault on the east. Disturbing new video shows what appears to be banned cluster munitions shelling a civilian area in Kharkiv. Tonight, the U.S. is stepping up, offering a new round of military aid. James Longman is in Kyiv once again for us tonight. Tonight, disturbing new video from Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine it appears to show what military experts say are cluster bombs being used to attack the city and terrorize civilians. In response to Russia's onslaught in the east, the U.S. is putting more weapons in the hands of Ukrainian fighters. An $800 million package, including long-range artillery systems, which are being sent to Ukraine for the first time. Ammunition and armored personnel carriers, too. And there'll be more help in the skies. Additional helicopters now going in as well. He failed to take Kyiv, but tonight Vladimir Putin is positioning his troops for that eastern assault. Satellite images show his forces on the move, armored vehicles and support equipment ready to attack. Putin says he wants to combat what he calls the NATO threat, but tonight that strategic goal unraveling. We need to assess how our possible NATO membership... Finland and Sweden, traditionally neutral, are now moving closer to membership in the alliance. This comes after President Biden, for the first time, called Russia's war in Ukraine genocide. Yes, I call it genocide. Putin is just trying to wipe out the idea of even being able to be a Ukrainian. And uh, the, mount, the evidence is mounting. The discovery of five bodies in a Butra basement, their hands bound, apparently tortured and executed, alerted the world to possible war crimes here. And tonight, the mother of one of those men is speaking out. They came like a hurricane, causing so much pain. And for what, she asks. Galina Machoshko has now taken refuge at a monastery. She's too scared to go home. She says her son Serhi was helping evacuees when the Russians arrived. For what? She keeps repeating. She can't understand his pointless murder. Russia says this didn't happen. What would you say to Vladimir Putin? Look at what you did to us, she says. What is our fault? What have I done wrong? Why am I crying at a stranger's place with no home to live in? You have children. What if the same happened to them? When our people come to tell you it's all fake, would you believe them? Our thanks to James Longman for that. Putin's wrath is very much fueled by ego. Russia's president is known for his desire to hold on to money and power. And our next guest is all too familiar with this on a personal level. Bill Browder was an early investor in Russian companies following the breakup of the Soviet Union. But that all changed following the death of his young lawyer inside a Russian prison in 2009. It was a search for answers and accountability that made Browder an enemy of Putin and his oligarch friends. Browder detailed his unweaving of the web of financial corruption in his new book, Freezing Order, a true story of money laundering, murder, and surviving Vladimir Putin's wrath. Bill Browder, kind enough to join us in studio today. Thank you so much for being here. 
so let's just get a, a sense of how all of this started, right? You were looking into uh, the Russian oligarchs laundering money, and what tipped you off to that, and then what led Putin ultimately to you? Well, so I was an investor in Russia. <clears throat> I was investing in big Russian companies. The oligarchs were stealing money from those companies. And I tried to stop them from stealing by exposing their theft through the international media. That led me to being expelled from Russia. The authorities raided my offices in Moscow. <clears throat> I had a young lawyer named Sergei Magnitsky investigate the raids. And he discovered a $230 million government corruption scheme that was connected to the raids. He exposed it. He testified against the officials involved. He was subsequently arrested, tortured for 358 days, and killed in Russian police custody. Sergei Magnitsky died at the age of 37. Um, he left a wife and two children. I've made it my life's work since his murder to go after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And the one real tool of justice that I came up with was something called the Magnitsky Act, which has been implemented in the United States and 33 other countries. And it freezes the assets and bans the visas of the people who were involved in his murder and the people who commit other similar abuses. Vladimir Putin has made it his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act, and he's gone after me personally with death threats, kidnapping threats, arrest warrants, Interpol, red notices, extradition requests, lawsuits, etc., to try to ruin my life. And you've said in the past that, that typically money laundering is a, a faceless, victimless act. But in this case, Sergei Magnitsky was uh, an actual victim. When you decided that you were going to take it to the next level and make this your mission, did you have any idea just how dangerous it would be for you personally? Well, I knew it would be dangerous, but I also knew that I, I had a duty to do something because Sergei Magnitsky was killed in my service. He was killed because he was my lawyer. <clears throat> and I couldn't back down out of fear. Um, I couldn't moderate my behavior. I couldn't edit uh, or self-censor. I had to get to the truth, and I had to expose the truth, and I had to make sure that the people who killed him uh, couldn't enjoy the money and, couldn't face, uh, and, and would have to face justice of one sort or another. So the Magnitsky Act that you talked about, uh, President Obama signed that into law in 2012. Now, 10 years later, tell us how that's being used with regard to sanctions against Russians. So the Magnitsky Act was was pretty a novel idea. It used to be that if you sanction a country, you sanction the whole country, you sanction at the whole, everybody. The Magnitsky Act was about picking out individuals who were particularly important and targeting them specially. So it's it's something that really infuriates all the oligarchs infuriates Putin and has a very big effect. In 2018, it sounds like uh, Putin approached then President Trump and proposed swapping 12 Russian officers in exchange for you. When you heard that, what, what did you think? <laughs> I was mortified. So <clears throat> I was, here was the president of the United States offering to hand me over to a malicious foreign power who wanted to kill me. It, it sounds like, based on reports that we're hearing, that in recent days and weeks, Vladimir Putin is becoming more and more isolated. Do you feel that anyone in his inner circle is really telling him the truth about the war? Well, I think he knows exactly what's going on with the war, and I think he's really upset. I think he's humiliated because um, he never expected that the Ukrainians would be so brave and so effective. He also didn't expect that the West would be so unified. In your estimation, how does this war end? The answer is it doesn't end. Oh. So there's two ways it could end. It could either end because um, uh, the Ukrainians defeat the Russians, and I think there's a small chance that, that happens if we help them. It could also end in Ukraine because Russians uh, win in Ukraine and then they go on to another country and maybe even a NATO country. But the most likely outcome is a stalemate. And you talked about that scenario of the four black SUVs coming to get you. How were you able to avoid that? And, and do you now live every day in fear? The answer is I don't live in fear, because if you live in fear, then you start to censor yourself. Oh. I take great precautions. I try to do everything possible not to give them an opportunity. But I, I, I don't live in fear, because my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who is in a much more dangerous situation, didn't live in fear. And I owe it to him to make sure that I go after the people that killed him. What a courageous man you are. Bill Browder, we thank you so much. Great to have you here with us in studio. And you can pick up his book, Freezing Order, A True Story of Money Laundering Murder and Surviving Vladimir Putin's Wrath. It is available wherever books are sold.
And still to come, our look around the world, including the growing tragedy in South Africa after a flood has left hundreds dead. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In South Africa, recovery efforts are getting underway after heavy rains caused massive landslides that killed 259 people. The storm also washed out major roads and disrupted shipping on the southeastern coast of Africa. The area is on the front line of ocean weather systems that scientists believe will only grow stronger with global warming. Recovery efforts are also underway in the Philippines. Typhoon Meiji is being blamed for 56 deaths so far. Search and rescue crews continue to sift through the wreckage. Meanwhile, relief workers are rushing to distribute aid to the more than 40,000 people displaced by the storm and the landslides that followed. And in Peru, this eyewitness video shows an ancient pre-Inca fortress wall collapsing amid heavy rains there that have lashed the country this week. Peru's Ministry of Culture said that the wall was about 50 feet long and 40 feet high and had stood since about the 10th century. In the next few weeks, the U.S. Supreme Court will issue a major decision on the ability of the Environmental Protection Agency to set strict limits on greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. It will impact the fight against climate change and efforts to protect communities hit the hardest by it. Tonight, we're in the heart of coal country, West Virginia, for a closer look at the stakes with rare access inside one of the largest coal-fired power plants in the country. Here's our Devin Dwyer. The water was over the face of the clock and over the top of the cars. In Clendenin, West Virginia, scars of a 1,000-year flood are still visible on Main Street. This was steps to a, to a building that was like a restaurant before. In 2016, torrential rains from a passing storm inundated the Elk River Basin, killing 23 people and causing more than a billion dollars in damage. We have a lot of uh, less fortunate people in our area. So that even made it worse. The storm that hit was exceptional and rare, but scientists say the threat from severe floods fueled by climate change is rising across West Virginia, compounded by its unique landscape and mining for coal. Mountaintop removal to get easy access to coal has created vulnerabilities for these valley communities. Water rushes off these hillsides into the streams. West Virginia has had more flooding disasters over the last 70 years than any other state except California and Texas. Storms have been more frequent and more powerful, dumping 55% more rain. I have never seen flooding like I've seen here in the past, really in the past 20 years. Maria Gano, whose family has lived in and mined in these mountains for generations, blames greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels, including coal. We can't continue to risk everything. 
for energy. You know, I mean, the coal keeps the lights on, they say, but at what cost? As climate costs mount, West Virginia's political leaders and energy companies are fighting to defend coal at the U.S. Supreme Court, which will decide this spring how far the federal government can go in regulating greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. It has incredible um, potential to affect how EPA and other agencies write regulations for years to come. This is one of the largest coal-fired power plants in the country, John Amos, right here. These are the 50 acres of Appalachian coal that's taken by these conveyor belts from barges and rail into the power plant facility just down the way. It's one of 174 coal-fired plants nationwide that will be impacted by the court's decision. It burns up to 27,000 tons of coal a day, powering more than 2 million homes and businesses across three states. This is where the coal is actually burned, ignited through these burners into the boilers, creating 3,000 degree heat, sending ash and 10.8 million tons of CO2, or the equivalent of more than 2 million cars driven for a year. The plant has been emitting earth warming gases since the early 1970s. EPA regulations forced coal fired power plants to install what are called scrubbers. These contraptions at the bottoms of the stacks to remove sulfur dioxide from the exhaust. What they don't remove is carbon dioxide. As the EPA prepares to issue new limits on carbon dioxide, power plant officials and allies like Clendenin Mayor Kay Summers worry it could lead to fewer jobs and higher electricity prices. They want to make rules, but they don't understand because they don't walk in those shoes. So how much has coal been a part of your life and your family? Oh, it's pretty much everybody's, you know, West Virginia period, it's pretty much in everybody's life. Ricky Brookover, a union boiler maker who works overnight at John Amos, welcomes the state's plan to keep burning coal there until 2040. I think we need coal until we have, an, you know, until they figure out an alternate source. Do people feel like the climate is changing because of the gases coming out of the plant? No, I don't think in this area people really do. When they hear EPA, what do they think? They probably cringe at it. Cringe? Right. West Virginia generates about 90% of its electricity from coal-fired power plants. While many states in the country have begun pivoting quickly away from coal, this state is digging in. While the EPA does have a narrow array of authority to act in the area of carbon emissions, it's nowhere near what the Biden administration is suggesting. West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey is leading the group of 18 states suing the EPA over its power to regulate greenhouse gases. Why fight the EPA when they're fighting to protect West Virginia from some of the most harmful impacts of climate change? I mean, isn't that what they're trying to do? Our people want to have clean air. They want to have clean water. Absolutely. But you have to go through the process the right way way to allow unelected bureaucrats to just decide it under the guise of good government that's not right this is congress's decision to make not the epa but you know you look at the clean air act and congress pretty explicitly there asked for the epa to do some regulatory work well the authority wasn't delegated to the epa to run and completely reorder the state's electricity systems. The EPA the says Clean Air Act authority is critical to cutting U.S. carbon emissions in half by 2030. If West Virginia succeeds in limiting that authority, that goal could be impossible to meet. Why is that authority so important? Because it protects human health and the environment. If they can't respond to uh, new and emerging threats, then Congress would have to pass a law every time something new comes along. While the legal fight plays out, energy companies have slowly been transitioning to cheaper alternatives to coal. It's still the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, but plays a smaller and smaller role in powering America. I grew up in coal country. I come from a community where we're seeing massive job losses, massive job losses. So can solar and coal coexist here? Coal and solar have to coexist here. In the shadow of the John Amos power plant, Keena Mullins runs West Virginia's largest commercial solar installation. She's not opposed to coal or the EPA, but says solar needs to be part of the state's future. You're not trying to replace coal. You're trying to get a seat at the table with a market that's evolving. Absolutely. Just like um, in your household, you would not want to put all your eggs in one basket. It's just diversifying our energy portfolio. Do you feel like coal is dying here? Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah. 
Coal may be dying, but many here aren't ready to let it go. And as the state wages war on the EPA, environmental advocates are braced for the worst. What's the impact going to be here? The impact here is going to be increased mining, increased pollution. The coal industry has always kept our people in the dark. And I don't look for it to change. And in Clendenin, they're still rebuilding and still skeptical of an EPA trying to protect them from the worst of climate change. How concerned are you about this happening again? I'll be honest with you, every time it rains and storms, I'm lying awake at night. But I really, I know it can happen, but I just don't think it will happen again. It, yes, it was a thousand year flood, but the warmer we get, the more intense. Is and it more warm right now? And what's the date? <laughs> it's cold. That's right. It's cold right now. It's weather all over. You know what? I'm not a scientist and I just don't believe it. We shall see how that debate winds up. Our thanks to Devin and still to come. Our conversation with the first black housewife to grace the real housewives of Beverly Hills about her inspiring journey to Hollywood and beyond. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Mommy. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. She made a name for herself as a successful model and actress starring in hits such as The Jamie Foxx Show, Coming to America, and Models, Inc. Now she is the first black housewife to grace the real housewives of Beverly Hills. Garcelle Beauvais is here to spill all the tea for us today on her new book, Love Me As I Am, an inspiring memoir about her journey that got her to where she is today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay. I am a fan of yours and everything you do. Oh, well, congratulations. thank you so much for saying that, Garcelle. Great to have you in studio with us, talking about Love Me As I Am. First yes. of all, love the, love the title of the book. Um, just give us a sense of, how it was to really make yourself more vulnerable to public criticism, because you really went there, especially talking about uh, your past in a way that you, you don't really on, on The Housewives. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was really important to be authentic. And if I'm gonna write a book, and I've always been an open book, but I did, like you said, go deeper, it really had to be what I went through. Mm -hmm. I really had to be honest, not only for me, but for the stories that I tell. And it just felt like a right time to, uh, to tell my journey. I mean, I came from, you know, Haiti at the age of seven. I didn't speak a word of English. English. <laughs> and uh, I learned watching Sesame Street. So it's really sort of the American dream without me knowing that it was the dream. My mom just brought us here for a better opportunity and I needed to seize every opportunity that came my way that was important. And certainly you have and, and continue to do <laughs> so. You. What were you most apprehensive about sharing? Anything that you thought, oh. So many things, <laughs> least, Lindsay, so many things. Um, I think my relationship with my dad, I never really dealt, delved deep with because I thought I didn't need a dad. I, you know, I knew my mom's side of the story. I really was raised by her. And so I was 
nervous to share that because it just, uh, it could say a lot of things. You can say, well, maybe that's why she chose the men that she chose because of daddy issues, which I'm sure there's some of that in there. But it was important to be vulnerable with that and my regrets of not giving him a chance and him not wanting a chance to be in my life and really not being seen by him. And this is the man that is supposed to be the first love of my life, right? And then stories on um, Hollywood, and the people that I mention in the book, and as well as, you know, dealing with my divorce. You know, I was in my late 40s. This is not when no one wants to get divorced in your late 40s and have to start all over. But um, that was the hand I was dealt, and, you know, I had to make the best of it. And I also wanted to share that women can go on and do great things even after mm -hmm. something as devastating as a divorce or betrayal or whatever you want to call it. And speaking of the Hollywood aspect of yeah. it all, let's talk about Erica Jane for a moment. So she really did you a big favor, I think, you know? <laughs> she threw your book in the trash, posted it on Instagram in the trash can. And tagged me. That's kind of great publicity, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, when you look at it that way, yes, it was great publicity. I mean, I'm sorry that she was hurt, yeah. but I just reposted uh, a clip that was actually in the trailer for the new season, which comes out May 11th. So I think it works for everybody. And the tension still exists? Have you guys... Oh, I haven't uh, seen her. And then defenses? Oh, okay. No, I All haven't right. seen her. We'll see each other, I'm sure, at the reunion. And, and so you also dedicate an entire chapter to talking about a, a black woman in Hollywood and, and finding your voice and navigating that whole yeah. aspect. How much of that do you think has, has changed and, and what do you feel are some, some urgent next steps? Oh, absolutely. I think there's definitely been change. When you see shows like um, Scandal, the Viola Davis uh, show. How to, how to Get Away With Murder. How to Get Away With Murder. So when you see shows like that where black women are leads, black women, you have the Ava DuVernay's, you have the Issa Rae's, and women that are bringing stories about us on television, and they're doing well. Mm -hmm. It's about time that we're validated for our worth and what we bring, the value that we bring. And also, we watch a lot of television and movies, so why shouldn't we see ourselves represented in that way? What I feel is we've come a long way, but of course, there's a lot more to go. And you also include Garcelle's gems, uh, which is lots of quotes that, that you find helpful mm -hmm. in life. Among them, uh, mind your business, Garcelle, mind your business. How do you feel that that is, is helpful? You know, the idea of staying out of grown folks' business. Yeah, you know what, that's how I grew up. We were seen and not heard, especially in a, you know, a Haitian household. You minded your business and you stayed out of grown folks' business. But for me, sometimes you have to go, you know what? I don't need to I don't need to put myself in that game. I can just sit back and watch it. And I think those are the times that you have to learn like when to step in and when to step out gracefully. All of us have to learn that lesson. <laughs> What's next for you? Oh, there's so many things that I want to do. You know, I love that I am open to all things that are great. Do you know what I mean? I'm open to producing. Um, I have a couple of projects that I can't say just okay. yet, but, and I'm open to finding love. You know, love me as I am. I'm putting it out there. All right. I don't <laughs> think you're gonna have a hard time finding love. Garcelle, great to have you with us Thank here you. in studio. And you can pick up her book, Love Me As I Am, now available wherever books are sold. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC.